kids. Um, okay, so almost all of you know who I am already. But for the two of you who don't, three including the cameraman, I'm Mark Lynch and I work for EBSCO Information Services. So I'm going to talk to you today about data-driven deployments in CA release automation. Disclaimer. Um, so I've spent most of my career in software QA, uh, but for the past couple of years, uh, I've been working mostly in the DevOps space. My involvement with CA release automation began when EBSCO decided that we needed an or, um, enterprise orchestration solution as part of our continuous delivery tool chain. So I'm going to talk to you today about where EBSCO is in its CD journey, um, why we chose CA release automation, why we went with a data-driven approach, and where we think we're going to go from there. So EBSCO Information Services is a division of EBSCO Industries that provides access to databases, journals, ebooks, and magazines, as well as a versatile discovery tool to search all the library's uh, resources. And like many uh, companies that have been around for a while, their development organization was once characterized by silos doing principally waterfall style development. Then that was followed by a period of increasing adoption of agile practices at the team level. But today, as an organization, we've embraced lean principles and are actively adopting scaled agile framework 4.0 to leverage the benefits of active value stream uh, refinement and adoption of agile methodologies across our development organization. So important to our adoption of SAFE is the implementation of continuous delivery to achieve standardization of our deployments across all of our um, environments, enterprise level views into the versions of our applications that are installed across our technology landscape, and ultimately, zero-touch automated deployments. So we've got a ways to go before achieving all that, but that's what we're working towards. So we want to use CA release automation to help standardize our deployment work workflows and um, work towards all, all of the uh, uh, benefits of end-to-end -end pipeline uh, view of deployments and governance controls and so forth. So if EBSCO was a startup, we would be living in a greenfield space. We wouldn't have to concern ourselves a great deal with legacy deployments, or, um, technology stacks, and, uh, infrastructure. And we'd build continuous delivery into everything that we're doing from the get-go. But we're not a startup. EBSCO is a relatively mature organization, and as such, where we live has perhaps more to do with a more urban setting, where there's established infrastructure and tech stacks that our continuous delivery journey has to account for and navigate. It's not the case that we're simply going to sweep all of that away and start over from scratch, but instead, we want to improve um, much of what we have incrementally where that makes sense, and where it doesn't make sense, completely replace and re-engineer um, the, the current deployment technologies. Over time, the technologies that we have used for do, doing deployments have excuse me, proliferated and evolved themselves, resulting in a substantial diversity of deployment technologies across our tech stack. So with all that in mind, the challenge given to those of us tasked with implementing RA at EBSCO included the following. We're to bring the existing application deployments into CA release automation with minimal re-engineering. We don't want complete replacement 
of our existing deployment technologies and approaches to be a barrier to entry to using RA. Additionally, we need to accept that those existing deployment approaches are to varying degrees still manual in nature. Across our diversity of deployments, there's quite a variety of automation already in place, greater and lesser degrees. But once we get those existing deployment processes on board to CARA, we want to leverage the data that's accumulated by doing deployments in RA and that's accumulated in RA to highlight the high value opportunities for automation of existing parts of those deployment processes, or in so much as we can, identify those deployment processes that really just be, should be re-engineered from the ground up. And finally, we need and want to empower our developers, our DevOps engineers, and any other skilled SDLC contributor to be able to incrementally and iteratively improve any existing deployment processes that we're not re-engineering right away. So we basically want to use CA release automation as a platform for transitioning to doing continuous delivery as a normal part of doing our business. When thinking about all that, we decided that a data-driven approach would allow us to create a minimal set of CARA templates, limiting the amount of RA ob objects that we need to maintain, and reduce or shallow out the learning curve for new RA users so that they don't have to worry a great deal about understanding all of the relationships between the different objects and entities um, needed to set up an application and uh, shared components and processes and templates. And empower our DevOps and, and developers uh, um, to be able to uh, automate using their existing skills. In some cases, uh, developers, of course, who are familiar with primarily doing programming in, in languages such as Java or C Sharp or whatever it is. DevOps engineers might be more familiar with scripting languages such as Python or Ruby or Bash. And we want them to be able to continue to use those skills that they already have without acquiring a whole new set of skills in order to be able to move forward. So to do this, we first selected our simplest deployment architecture, that of a single server deployment architecture, then created our first two deployment templates in RA. I wanted this to be one template, but the Windows and the Linux templates had to be just a little bit different, and so we ended up with two. And then we created a contract for our users for taking advantage of those templates in RA that is represented by what we're calling a deployment zip file, which has important components, or is composed of important components, including XML and wrapper scripts. The deployment zip file includes an installer's directory wherein whatever existing artifacts are currently being built for the current deployment processes go. And then a wrappers directory that contains one or more scripts used for making use of the contents of the installer's directory and scripts for doing any other automation tasks. And then the deployment.xml file that is composed of a simple structure allowing our, again, developers, DevOps uh, folks, or even release engineers, to specify the tasks necessary to actually accomplish a deployment. So the deployment.xml file bears some explanation. As I said, the structure is pretty simple, and it has three major sections in, in addition to a platform specification. The one-time pre-task section and the one-time post-task sections are structured identically and um, are composed of a set of tasks um, with the machine section being just a little bit different and, and including some flags for determining whether or not machines are, are to be taken out of service and returned to service, which I'll explain in a moment. 
But the key characteristic for uh, the pre-tasks and post-tasks is that those are tasks to be done once per deployment environment, as distinct from the machine section, which contains tasks which are to be run for every machine that software is being deployed to within that environment. So for an example of the one-time pre-task section, you can see that it's got a collection of tasks, and there are two and only two types of tasks there. You've got command type tasks, and you've got manual step type tasks. For a command task, typically there's a specification for the technology that's being used, in this case PowerShell, and a path to a wrapper script that's to be executed for that command, for that task, rather. In the case of PowerShell, we have to do a little bit more upfront and set um, an execution policy bypass so that all subsequent scripts can be run. For the manual steps, we include textual instructions that, as you can see, supports uh, certain basic HTML formatting to allow us to present uh, instructions to the user doing the deployments um, in a well-formatted and readable way. For the machine section of the XML, the structure is much the same, except for those two settings that I mentioned earlier on about removal from service and return to service, meaning these machines, if the flags are set to true, will be removed from load balancing and monitoring before any of the tasks are executed and returned to load balancing and monitoring afterward. So once a CI process is set up to take the existing set of deployment artifacts that, that were being produced and wrap that in the deployment zip uh, artifact, including the XML file, and publish that to a URL accessible location, you can then take advantage of one of the two deployment templates that we've created. Most of the people in this room are very familiar with RA already. Is there anybody here who hasn't used RA and doesn't really know what the deployment plan means in the context of RA? All right, so everybody understands that part already. So in order to make use of the deployment artifact, it needs to be associated with uh, a deployment plan. And to do that, we choose one of the, de the templates we've created. And in, in the context of the RA GUI, that's as simple as selecting from a list and clicking a button to begin the process of creating the deployment plan wherein the user is prompted to enter a URL to the published deployment zip artifact. Once that process is completed, we can then begin the process of actually doing the first deployment into a target environment. Once the deployment is named and the target environment is identified, the deployment will kick off, and RA will take care of the distrib distribution of the artifacts to the target machines, and read through the XML in that artifact and start processing the commands. For uh, script commands or command type tasks, um, RA simply runs those automatically, as you would expect. For manual type tasks, it prompts the user for input. And here we have an example of a manual task which includes bold, colored um, text, as well as an ordered list and an uh, external link. So you can get a feel for how relatively complex sets of instructions can be formatted in a way that are readable and uh, easily digested. So how do we do this? As I mentioned earlier on, RA takes care of the issue of distributing the artifact out to all of the machines that are assigned to the target environment. Built-in functionality takes care of that for us. But once they're there, once the artifact is there, we did have to create actions and flows that would unpack that artifact. And here we see a set of actions that set some parameters and then unzip the file. And here we have the small set of actions that actually reads the XML file and loops through 
the tasks in a particular section. And for the once per environment steps, that one time pre tasks and the one time post task sections in the XML, that's about as complex as it gets from an action and flow point of view. What we see here are some parameters being set at the top, the zip file being extracted in the middle, and then at the bottom, we're reading through the XML file and executing the manual task, tasks and the, um, excuse me, command tasks. For the per machine step um, part of the deployment, this gets quite a bit more complicated though. If you can see a yellow box in the upper left hand corner, sorry, your left corner of the diagram here and another yellow box in more or less the middle, those are the two sets of flows that you saw on a larger scale in previous uh, slides that take care of the unzipping of the deployment zip artifact and the reading of the XML and execution of the tasks therein. The other major sections that you see in the diagram concern the removal from um, monitoring and removal from load balancing before the deployment tasks and return afterwards. The reason that those are quite so dense and complex is because they deal, uh, a lot of them deal with the construction and execution of REST calls out to the load balancing service and the monitoring service. And because REST calls somewhat routinely get dropped um, or fail for transient reasons when being issued, we had to build in a fair amount of um, error handling, uh, retries, and, uh, and actions to, to capture useful information to feed back to a user should uh, any such errors or, or uh, complete sets of retries fail and provide the, the necessary information for the user to know whether or not they're in a position to be able to intervene and let the deployment proceed or simply terminate the deployment. So having done all that and started to roll that out, we, we have a uh, we have a growing enthusiasm among, among our uh, currently small user base at the moment. A lot of enthusiasm from people are looking to get on. But we know that we have uh, a set of uh, next improvements that we really want to make in what we've seen here, which includes automating the creation of uh, the release automation environments, which is currently a one-time onboarding step that our users have to go through, and it's kind of cumbersome. So we'd like to alleviate that from very quickly if we can. And in addition to that, we want to hook in to, this, to their CI to automatically create deployment plans once an artifact is created and execute the first deployment. Now, that's a fairly straightforward thing to do in RA. We've done it in POCs and other experiments and whatnot. Um, we just didn't want to make it a requirement for initial onboarding onto uh, our data-driven approach here. But it's often one of the first questions that come up as we start to get people on board um, because it seems like a very automatable thing, and it really is. In addition to that, we're going to start to need to address um, how to use a data-driven approach to accomplish multiple multi-tier application deployments, uh, which is going to involve the creation of uh, some new actions, flows, and templates, uh, undoubtedly. And finally, or rather not finally, but in addition, uh, we're going to need to figure out how CIRA is going to be involved in orchestrating um, our blue-green deployments for cloud-oriented microservices. We have a separate initiative that um, is uh, becoming fairly mature in building out the foundation for accomplishing our blue-green deployments. Um, we're confident that CA, um, RA, is what we're going to be using to orchestrate that. And whether or not that's going to involve our data-driven approach or not is still unclear, but we do need to figure that out. So in summary, We're working to leverage RA to accelerate our standardization of, de of deployments and, and use that, in fact, to start to standardize our, our deployments. Even though we're, we're allowing a lot of diversity initially, it becomes the one kind of level of standardization where people start to plug into. And then as they re-engineer and replace their current deployment technology, we want to build in more and more standardization as that matures. 
and continue to allow and support our skilled engineers of various types to um, use their existing skills to push all that forward. Some of what we found was that the data-driven approach was fairly easy for people to understand and, and get the hang of. Um, but when it came to us building out uh, these interactions with third-party uh, tools using REST calls, we had a lot of work to do in terms of making sure that it was a robust solution and um, we could have uh, consistently successful deployments regardless of what environments they're in and how busy those services might be and so forth. Does anybody have any questions? Be disappointed if you didn't. Thank you. And in fact, I would highly recommend you post this separately on the community site. Yes. If you've got a if you've got a sample, mm -hmm. uh, you know, a sample project that you can either upload or diagram out as part of this, that would be very useful. There would be a lot of people who weren't able to attend here mm -hmm. who would be very interested in this based on the kind of questions I've seen. Uh, yes. Would you agree? Yes, I think so. Yeah. Okay. Especially overseas. And especially in conjunction with the new Express project. I did. I went to visit Asseth earlier today. He gave me a look at it. So my, I had really my biggest question mm -hmm. was around where you had to, the, the place where you had the difficulty. The, the rest calls? The rest calls to third party products. Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now typically we normally have two, two ways of handling that kind of activity. Mm -hmm. Okay. Either you're doing the RDK or the SDK. Yes. You chose to stay with the stock rest calls. Yes. Why? Um, when I looked at the RDK for building out around that, from what I recall, uh, some of the limitations in that were that it was um, intended for kind of wrapping CLI type commands and a couple of other categories of commands, but I didn't recall. Rest. Oh, one of them is REST? Okay. Um, it, wasn't, it wasn't clear to me that the types of things that we needed to build out, part of which was a voyage of discovery, to be quite honest. Um, I was there. Right. Uh, so it, it wasn't clear that the RDK would uh, accommodate everything that we thought we would need to do, including when a REST call fails, or rather, um, the, the pre-quote REST call status check, which is in of itself a REST call, um, the actions that we have surrounding that involving construction of the REST call elements, the endpoint and the payload, and um, the analysis of the response that comes back, which has to be handled differently depending on you know, uh, what service you're dealing with and what, you're, what REST call you're actually executing. And, um, let me see, okay, yeah, the, the retry functionality where we included the ability for on a, on a failed REST call, uh, once we understood that it failed, to try it a few more times with an increasing interval and so forth. Um, wasn't clear to us that the RDK would support doing all of that. The SDK, it was fairly clear that we would be able to do that in the SDK, but as I say, we were still kind of figuring out what all the parameters were of what we need to account for. And we had internal discussions about, after we've nailed all that down, and, and now that we've actually got it implemented using stock rest calls and, and other kinds of actions, should we use the SDK to re-engineer that whole process for something that is, uh, that's fairly RA specific, or should we engineer some external library that, um, that are kind of other RA users and experts might already be familiar with in a language such as Python or, or what have you. Um, so essentially, in a very long-winded way, that conversation is still going on. And, to, and, and the direct answer to your question was, we didn't really know what we were getting into to really make the best decision of the most efficient way 
to solve the problem at the time. I think we're in a place where we want to re-engineer what we have. We're, we, yeah, we haven't settled on which way, and we also haven't prioritized when we now want to replace it because we now have a working solution, right? If, it's, if it keeps standing up, the ir ironic thing is, if it stands up pretty well, um, it might take a while for us to actually re-engineer that piece. Um, if, it, if it doesn't, if it's problematic and not robust enough, then that will certainly motivate us to, to replace it also. Yes. Typically would refer to the scripts that are in the wrapper form. Exactly. Okay, so I can, I don't have to have artifacts physically out of the program chains. I can have them included within the deployment zip, and it extracts the script that I'm about to execute through PowerShell or et cetera. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. Yes. And that's one of the beauties of this in, this in the sense. Yeah, and I actually forgot to mention that during the, the presentation. I'm very glad that you brought it up. Um, our entire intention is that once a team, a development team, has got on board with this and they've got their uh, CI setup built so that not only are they creating their, their standard set of artifacts but also building this deployment zip wrapper around it, um, once they've defined their steps in their deployment.xml, let's assume for a moment that they've defined everything as a manual step. And then tomorrow, the first engineer comes along and decides, I'm going to automate step one. After they write the script to do that and put it in the wrapper script directory, or at least the place in their, um, in their uh, um, excuse me, source control that the, scrapper, uh, the wrapper script directory gets built from, they then go and make a small change in the XML to convert it from a manual step to an automated step. Right? So change the type, set the path, and that part is done. And then they commit both the script, uh, the wrapper script, and uh, their new version of the XML to the same source control repo that all of the application source control is in. And the one CI process will build their application artifacts plus the deployment zip artifacts as one big package that goes together everywhere it needs to go. So they don't, they don't have to worry about pulling those things together later. Uh, are you using the Jenkins plugin to call RA, or are you calling RA to a REST call to start the deployment, or is that a separate process right now? That's one of the next steps that we want to um, do, uh, enhance this with. Right now, um, it's a manual step, basically. Once they publish to a URL, they have a manual step of going and choosing a template and specifying what the source of that URL is. Um, but the next obvious step is to use the, the Jenkins plugin to um, kick that stuff off automatically. Well, one of the things, if I remember correctly, during our initial implementation with you was that part of the challenge is that not all the artifacts that are necessary to be deployed are actually in the CI, whether it's Git or Jenkins or anything else. Right. So that's part of the challenge of using that as an API, because the stuff isn't even actually in there. Right. So, so for teams that, that are in that situation, um, with their current application deployments, they probably will have to do some re-engineering to get on board to this. Um, but for teams that are, um, have a more streamlined uh, uh, repository and build uh, process already, then they should be able to plug into this process relatively simply. And that's, that's really the idea. And that's, of course, your newer application, whereas this more legacy stuff gets kind of scattered. Yeah, but, but we, we definitely designed this to try to accommodate our legacy stuff and get them on board um, rather than insist that they re-engineer everything right off the bat, right? So once again, if they've got a single repo with their source code and um, they, they uh, build in and they've got Jenkins already building their artifacts and they, they build in the wrapper scripts and the deployment XML that describes all the deployment, um, they're, they're on the path into this. Uh, if they have got disparate, let's say, test suites and whatnot that are scattered all around the place, if they write a wrapper script that pulls that all together for them during the deployment, then that'll work too. So one of the things that it's probably worth pointing out, um, 
is that you can think of the, the wrapper script as, uh, our wrapper script directory as being primarily used to call whatever's in the installer's directory, right? But if you can write wrapper scripts to accomplish relatively complex tasks at deployment time for you, that's within your power as a developer or as a DevOps engineer, and you don't have to come to me as an RA expert to try to figure out how to do that in RA for you. You don't have to go to your release engineer to have him re-engineer hit the build jobs to pull all that stuff together and make sure that it's all getting passed through. You're empowered to do that yourself, which was a key part of the design here, is that we want this to be as self-service as we can make it. And we did spend quite a chunk of time after putting everything together into a, a functioning solution to put together a collection of documentation that augments uh, the CARA doc documentation for getting people familiar with CARA. For our, for our point of view, we had, uh, created new documentation to get them familiar not only with the parts of RA that they need to be concerned with because they don't need to worry about the, uh, you know, the application definition and the architecture definition and all that stuff, um, but the parts that are important to them and uh, how the, the, the data-driven approach works in the context of RA and what their responsibilities are and how to get on board. And we created reference repositories and reference build jobs and recorded uh, videotaped training sessions or, or created video training sessions uh, that people can, can use down the line um, of the, you know, the early adopters getting their hands-on um, training and uh, kind of hand-holding, as it were. So we've, we've gone to some lengths to try and make this something that will become self-service. Yes. So if you want to, within the same deployment, you could use PowerShell and, um, um, sorry, command, uh, batch scripts, right? Um, at the moment, we decided we would settle on supporting three scripting languages for doing deployments, right? And two native languages and one cross-platform. So on Linux, you've got bash. On Windows, you've got batch files and, uh, and, and sorry, PowerShell files. Uh, and for cross-platform, you've got Python. My reference to the batch files was um, mistaken. Uh, yeah, so yeah, you, you can mix and match those on a, on, a, on a given deployment if you care to. Why you'd want to do that is a bit of a mystery to me, but whatever works for you. If you, know, if you already have some automation to bring to the, to the party, as some of our early adopters do, um, they want to be able to plug their uh, automation scripts right into their wrappers directory, and uh, you know, they can do that. It's as simple as calling them from the deployment.xml. Thank you. Any other questions? Thank you. Um, thank you very much. <laughs> Recommended sessions. Must see demos. Can you go back to the I certainly can. No problem. Oh. Just going to walk away right now. <laughs> there we go. And thank you for your time and attention today. It's been a pleasure talking to you. Enjoy the rest of the conference. And as I will point out, Mark is an active member of our RA community. Yes. Okay, so please. Yes. Oh, uh, let me give a shout out to um, Nora. Was it Nora Kennedy who presented earlier on? Um, I don't know if, if anybody here was for that. Steve, Steve was here for that. I, I certainly, one of the things she, she pointed out was she highlighted the benefits of the communities um, about how active other customers are on there. Um, but I would add to that that we also have people like Chip and like Jackie and Asaf who are also active on the um, communities who are CI, CA developers, um, CA product managers, and, uh, and CA consultants. and. Yes. So everybody from the CA and consult and services side, mm -hmm. everybody who's involved with the product is on the community. Yeah. Okay. And if they can't answer your question, you know, it probably can't be answered. So 
Yeah, I've definitely found it very beneficial. <laughs> No apology needed. <laughs> and here ended the show. Thank you. Thank you.